So I think we're going to get started. Everyone's here. All right. Well, good afternoon and welcome. I'm Lisa Freeman, I'm Dean of the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences, and it's my honor and pleasure to welcome you here today to celebrate our newest distinguished professor in LES, Izet Joshkun. Uh, established in 2006, the Distinguished Professor Award recognizes faculty for their significant and sustained intellectual scholarship in their chosen fields and for their contributions to the LAS and UIC communities. Each year, the LAS Executive Committee selects award recipients from candidates in the humanities, social sciences, natural sciences, and interdisciplinary fields. The LAS community then comes together to learn about the distinguished professor's research and to toast their colleagues' accomplishments at their inaugural lecture, which is why we're gathered here today. Today, the college is proud to celebrate the achievements of Izet Joshkun, professor in the Department of Mathematics, Statistics, and Computer Science at UIC. The LAS Distinguished Professor honor recognizes the the, the excellence of a faculty member's entire scholarly and professional profile, and in every regard, Professor Joshkun exemplifies the standards for this prestigious award. Not only are his contributions to algebra algebraic geometry truly remarkable, as his nominator puts it, but over the past 15 years, he has built an internationally recognized research group and mentored dozens of students and postdocs. Professor Joshkun earned a PhD from the Department of Mathematics at Harvard University and his BA in Mathematics from Princeton University. Prior to joining UIC in 2007, he was the CLE Moore instructor at MIT for three years and a liftoff fe fellow at the Clay Mathematics Institute in the summer of 2004. Professor Joshkun's research covers topological and numerical invariance of moduli spaces of curves, surfaces, and sheaves, which sounds to someone like me very, very cool. Uh, also, bridgeland stability, rationally connected varieties, the cohomology of homogeneous varieties, and gramov witten theory. As his nominator states, this research has led to important breakthroughs in understanding the geometry of moduli spaces and has helped advance long-standing problems in the field. He has had a, quote, enormous influence on the entire field of algebraic geometry, end quote, and has published an astonishing amount of high-quality work. Professor Joshkun has over 60 papers in top mathematical journals, including most recently the Proceedings of the London Mathematical Society, the Journal of Differential Geometry, Journal of Algebra, and Algebra Number Theory, and is the co-editor of the book Surveys on Recent Developments in Algebraic Geometry. I'm guessing it's not the kind of algebra I did in high school. Naturally, this prolific and high-quality output has garnered accolades and awards from his peers and national organizations. In 2018, Professor Joshkin was elected as a fellow of the American Mathematical Society, which recognizes exceptional contributions to the field of mathematics. The following, following year, he was named a university scholar, a prestigious program sponsored by the Office of the President of the University of Illinois System. This, this award recognizes, quote, superior performance in scholarly activities in both research and teaching from faculty who show great promise for future achievements. He was named a UIC Researcher of the Year in 2013. In addition, Professor Joshkin's research has been supported by the National Science Foundation, the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation, and the National Academy of Sciences. Professor Joshkin is not only a superlative researcher, he is also a valuable member of the scholarly mathematical community and has been invited to deliver hundreds of seminar talks, colloquia, conference talks, and lecture series. To list a small sample of the most recent instances, the Smith Colloquium at the University of Kansas in March 2022, Brown University's Algebraic Geometry Seminar in April 2022, a conference talk at the University of Michigan, Ann Arbor in August 2022, SUNY Stony Brook's Algebraic Geometry Seminar in November 2022, and another talk, Vector Bundles in Chennai, in Chennai, India in February 2023. Very busy schedule. And this is only in the past couple of years. In fact, Professor Joshkin has been an active and sought after speaker for his entire career. His nominator comments that 
His willingness to share his insights and expertise with others is a testament to his commitment to sharing his ideas and advancing the field of algebraic geometry. Professor Joshkin's stature in his field derives from his leadership and mentoring roles, as well as from his impressive research accomplishments. He has had a, quote, massive impact on algebraic geometry at UIC in his building of the algebraic geometry group in the Department of Mathematics, Statistics, and Computer Science. Not only has he contributed his own expertise to the group, he has also helped to recruit and retain other top researchers to UIC. He is frequently asked to organize high-profile pro mathematical activities and events that bring together leading mathematicians from around the world. Professor Joshkun serves on the editorial boards of the journal of Pure and Applied Algebra and the European Journal of Mathematics and Advances in Geometry. He has also served on the editorial board of the Central European Journal of Mathematics from 2009 to 2014. In addition to his research, organizing, leadership, and service, Professor Joshkun has also mentored dozens of graduate students and postdocs during his career and received a graduate mentoring award from UIC in 2018. As his nominator explains, this mentorship is probably Izet's largest accomplishment and will likely leave the largest mark on mathematics. He is involved in a level of mentoring almost unseen within pure mathematicians, as such mentoring is laborious, involving close supervision, and weekly, hourly, one-on-one -on -one meetings discussing the small details of the research project. This, of course, is in addition to the time it takes to train mentees to give talks, write papers, and prepare for tenure-track job talks, all of which Professor Joshkin also does for his many students. This effort on behalf of the next generation of mathematicians has been acknowledged by the notices of the Amer American Mathematical Society, which has invited Professor Joshkin several times to author articles in the early career section of the journal. As this brief, and I would say all too brief, uh, given his many, many accomplishments, uh, uh, enumeration demonstrates, Professor Joshkin is in the midst of an extraordinary career. It is for his many academic and professional achievements and his dedication as a scholar, teacher, and mentor that we are delighted to bestow upon him the LAS Distinguished Professor Honor today. I would now like to invite Professor Joshkin to come forward to receive his Distinguished Professor Medallion. the highlight of the, of the evening, of course. Please join me in welcoming our esteemed colleague and the college's newest liberal arts and sciences distinguished professor, Izet Joshkun, to the podium to give his inaugural lecture entitled, Breaking Count, the Art of Specialization. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the very nice introduction, and thank you for all. For, thank you all for coming today. I'm greatly honored to receive uh, to be named the UIC Distinguished Professor, and I would like to thank. Let's, uh, let's do that. I would like to, to thank uh, Dean Freeman and. Uh, the college and f for this honor. And I would like to thank everybody who made this um, event possible. Um, unfortunately, I don't know everybody's names, so I'll just. Uh, <laughs> um, um, yeah, they say that it takes a village uh, to make a UIC distinguished professor. Let me tell you, these villagers must be pretty amazing because in my case, it has taken hundreds of people, uh, you know, distributed over four continents to bring me to this uh, place, uh, you know. Um, you know, I've been very lucky to have the mentorship and friendship of many amazing and exceptional people. 
Um, you know, family lore has it that already by the time I was one and a half, um, I liked uh, listening to my dad uh, give to their high school uh, students in math and physics. So you can see a picture of, let's see whether we can get, uh, yeah, maybe you can, oh, you can see a picture of my dad there, yeah. And, uh, you know, I, apparently I would listen to these tutoring sessions. So this was, you know, in a way, an analog version of Zoom bombing that our kids do. Um, and, uh, you know, one time the lore is that, you know, there, there was the student and I was being one and a half, was kind of disturbing. So I was told to leave the room. Being really indignant, I held my breath until I passed out. Well, so you can, you know, it's, I can only imagine what this poor student must, must have been thinking, you know. And, you know, since that day, I continue to, you know, um, give a hard time to students. And that has not, uh, that has not changed uh, at all, you know. And, yeah, I was very lucky to have excellent teachers, you know, from my fourth grade teacher who first got me into solving uh, word problems to, you know, my high school calculus teacher, Selim Tazal, who I'm still friends with, you know, they were really amazing people, and I'm really grateful for their, all that they taught me and their mentorship. And then in college, you know, like, I had one of the most amazing experiences, and, you know, there were all these amazing people from Eli Stein, who was my thesis advisor, to, you know, Andrew Wiles or Johan de Jong, who would later become my postdoctoral advisor, to, you know, Zoltan Jabo. I had, like, amazing people teach me, and it was, but one person really stands out, and that was Professor Robert Gunning. You know, it's hard to describe him. I think I took something like seven courses with him. But, you know, maybe what, uh, you know, I wish I could find this picture. A few months ago, there was a picture in the alumni magazine celebrating his re retirement. I couldn't find it, but let me describe it. There he was. You know, he always wore a bow tie with his bow tie. You know, teaching at age 91 on Zoom, <laughs> the students still. Yeah, I wish we can all have the same kind of dedication and we can be as inspirational or half as inspirational as he was. Um, and, you know, um, so, you know, I had, like, all these amazing people help me throughout. And then, of course, I got to grad school, and there is a picture of me advising. This thing, can you see the red off? Uh, there's a picture of my advisor, Joe Harris. So, you know, he was an absolutely fabulous advisor to have. Um, you know, not only is he one of the, you know, foremost algebraic geometers, um, but, you know, here I have, like, you know, this, this is a poster. You know, I tried to put this on, uh, on, the, on the screen, but it didn't help. So this is, you know, if you want, is a picture of the village. So this is like for his 70th birthday, one of our colleagues, um, Raul Pandrapande, made a chart of all his students, his students, students, and students, students, students. All in all, more than 296 people. Um, and so, you know, he was this, you know, I was very lucky to, um, to, to have the mentorship of such a great advisor who not only taught me a lot of math, but, you know, connected me to a community of great researchers who have been supporting me. Like, for instance, like uh, Jason Starbrand and Hassid Ravi Bakil and many of these people who have uh, supported me and probably wrote the recommendation letter that made it possible for me to give this lecture today. So, um, and then I've also had a wonderful time, the wonderful 15 years at UIC, and I would really like to thank all my uh, colleagues who have been there throughout this whole time, you know, and all of my colleagues, you know, from Eloy to Lawrence, everybody, right, uh, who, you know, make, uh, who make this possible. And, you know, I just uh, tell you, like, if you're an academic, you spend a lot of time in meetings. And most of these meetings, you know, are, uh, you know, things that you'd rather not be in. Um, but there is one exception. There is, I like uh, being uh, involved in these award committees because, you know, it's really nice to see what our colleagues are doing, and they are doing really amazing things. 
But let me tell you something. You always wonder who is the one who gets the award. There are many, many exceptional uh, colleagues here, but the ones who usually get the awards are the ones for which the nominator has put together the best, uh, the best um, file. And then, you know, I would like to thank especially um, Lawrence Ein, who was the one who recruited me to come to UIC, Kevin Tucker and Julius Ross for, you know, really going out of their way supporting me all these years. All right. Um, then, of course, you know, I should also mention that my family has always been there, as I mentioned. My, you know, there are the pictures there. My mom and dad and my wife, Alexandra, who is with us, and uh, the kids, Micah and Riva. So the names that you have to remember are Micah and Riva. They are going to make an appearance again. So, all right. <clears throat> so, I'm sure I'm forgetting to thank many other people, but uh, you know, I'm grateful for everybody. And then, you know, one thing that we always forget, in the village, the younger people are important. You know, we learn so much from our postdocs and, um, and um, our students, so I want to maybe quickly flash just the names of these wonderful postdocs that have been with us in the last 15 years. Many of them, of course, not quite distinguished professors at uh, distinguished places down south. And, of course, the graduate students who have been there and from which we learn so much. Um, so, Julius, I tell you that, uh, you know, I can't have more grad students. There is no more space to put, them, uh, to, to put them on the slide. All right, so this was the fun part of the talk. So now let's get to the really fun part of the talk. So let's get to mathematics. So let me tell you a little bit about what I do. Um, so I'm an algebraic geometer, uh, sorry. Uh, I do algebraic geometry, and algebraic geometry in a nutshell is the study of systems of polynomial equations, okay? So what's a polynomial? So a polynomial is a function that has some constants and that has some variables. So like for instance, we have x squared minus three x plus two. There x is a variable, and then the three and the two, or the minus three and the two are constants. So the only rule is that you, you have to be able to express this function by using just addition and multiplication and only finitely many of them. Yeah, probably most of you are uh, familiar with polynomials and you know, there can be one variable or many variables. So the first one is a polynomial of one variable and the next one is a polynomial, the next two are polynomials of two variables and then the last one I think is a polynomial with five variables, okay? And then one thing that you know, I will probably mention from time to time is the degree of a polynomial. And the way you can think about the degree of a polynomial is um, how many, what's the maximum number of times the variables have been multiplied together. So like if we look at x squared minus three x plus two, the x squared has x times x, so the degree of that one is two. x minus y has degree one and things like x to the fifth plus y to the fifth and so on and so forth has degree five. In fact, every term there has degree five, okay? So these are polynomials. And then what algebraic geometry does is study solutions of polynomials. In other words, the question that you ask, let me stop banging this, uh, the question that you ask is for which values is this polynomial zero? So for instance, if you take the first polynomial that we had there, x squared minus three x plus two, so then you can, you can um, factor that as x minus one times x minus two, and then what you see that the solutions of this polynomial are x equals one and x equals two. In other words, if I plug in one or two into this polynomial, then I get zero. And more generally, you can ask for solutions of systems of polynomials. So going back, if I take the next two polynomials, I can consider them together and ask when do they vanish? And then here I drew a little picture of it for you. If you look at the polynomial x minus y and set that equal to zero, you get the line x equals y, which I drew on the side. And then if you look at x squared plus y squared minus one, then you get a circle, the unit circle, that says that you are distance one away from the origin, 
and thus x squared plus y squared equals one. And now the question you're asking is that when did these two curves intersect? And um, you know the, you can solve for that, and then you see that you get you get these somewhat complicated expressions. And I specifically wanted to put somewhat complicated expressions there to 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 um, emphasize that when you say for which values does the polynomial vanish, there is a subtlety there that people spent more than 2,000 years to try to understand. And that is like, what number system are you using? And you know, people started by using integers. And this sort of follows you know, the way you learn um, you know, the number systems throughout your mathematical education. You first have the counting numbers. Then maybe you learn negative numbers. Maybe you then you learn fractions and ratios, and then you learn real numbers, and then you learn complex numbers, and so on and so forth. But in this talk, no complex numbers will appear, but whenever I talk about solving polynomial equations, I'm always solving them over the complex numbers. You know, this is a misnomer very much like you know, the Greenland Iceland kind of thing, right? Complex numbers are actually much easier to deal with than the real numbers, you know? But we say that as complex numbers just to scare people away. You know? <clears throat> All right, so that's the kind of questions that we are asking about. Like, when do a system of polynomials vanish, right? And I'm not, whoops, and I'm not going to, oops. I'm not going to say anything about the last polynomial, except that there are some physicist friends in the audience they all recognize it as the equation of a Calabi-Yau threefold. All right, now, why do you care? Why do we want to solve polynomial equations, right? The basic fact is that many systems in physics, chemistry, biology, economics, et cetera, they are described by polynomial equations. And here I picked three physics equations hopefully people are somewhat familiar with that show you that yes, these are polynomial relations. The first one is Newton laws that says that force is mass times acceleration. And then you see you can take you know, all three of these things to be variables if you want, and then F is M times A. The second one is Einstein's law that says that energy is the mass times the speed of light square, or E equals mc square. And the third one is the position of a particle. It doesn't matter what they are or why these things are true. The point is that these are important things in physics or chemistry or, you know, that, um, you, you know, that are described by polynomial equations. So many things that we see around us are given by polynomial equations, and very often you want to know, you know, when is this particle at a given point? So that's solving a polynomial equation. And the other point is that there are things that are not polynomial equations in life, like for instance, um, decay or something like this that can be given by an exponential, and very often non-polynomial functions have good polynomial approximations. So for instance, the exponential function can, is almost, is, excuse me, is almost that polynomial around x equals zero. And then, you know, very often we are trying to describe the world, uh, you know, whether this is the economic, economical world or the chemi chemistry or physics or biology, you run into these polynomial systems and you want to know when are these things, um, when are these things equal? And let me tell you that, you know, solving polynomial equations is a true existential problem. And if you don't believe me, ask the dinosaurs. All right, so here is, here is a picture of like, you know, will this asteroid hit Earth? And you know, the way you would answer this question is you would, um, you would, um, you, would uh, you know, look at the paths of this asteroid and look at the path of Earth, which are given roughly by polynomial equations and ask when do they intersect. So here I have a picture, apparently almost a, a little bit over a year ago, some asteroid came fairly close to Earth. And this is a little drawing that NASA, um, the Jet Propulsion Lab put out. Uh, and notice how close to Earth that is because the orbit you see is orbit of a satellite. Like you don't even see the moon there. The moon is way out of the, way out of the picture here. Um, so, you know, but if you want to know whether, uh, you know, um, you're going to get, uh, you know, this asteroid will hit the Earth, then you likely have to solve some polynomial equations. 
Or similarly, you know, there is a terrible war going on in Ukraine, and then, you know, this is something that people really need to get right, right? And then, you know, if there's a missile incoming, right, can you intercept that missile by, you know, whatever the Patriot missile or something like this? And these kinds of questions all depend on solving polynomial equations, and maybe something that's closer to, to uh, you know, when will the LAS become solvent, you know? I tried to put a picture of this one, and I Googled it. I kept getting unicorns, so I don't know whether. <clears throat> All right, so, so you know, solving polynomials is an important, is an important business, you know. Um, all right, but you know, not all polynomial systems are the same. So you know, the kind of question that you can ask, like, what are the polynomial systems that interest me? And then, you know, I'm interested in interpolation problems. So what's an interpolation problem? Very roughly, you, know, you give yourself a bunch of points, and you're asking, can I pass a curve to those points? Right? Or when can I pass a curve to those points? Or can I find the equation of the curve that passes through those points? And then, you know, like, if you want a more concrete, uh, like, problem, like, you know, say that you are observing, you're trying to find the path of an asteroid or a planet or something like this, how many measurements do you have to do before you know its path? And, like, from the given measurements, can I determine its path? How many times do I have to observe this thing and so on and so forth? Right? So there are two important facts here already that were known to Euclid. Yeah, and these are uh, really nice. The first is, you know, if you give yourself two points, then there is a unique line through those two points. And in fact, you know, this Micah has been learning uh, in eighth grade how to write down the equation of that line. And, you know, there is a process of doing it. So, you know, we, these days we certainly teach it to the ninth, eighth grader or ninth graders, right? But, uh, and I'll tell you in a little bit how to do it, but you know, the, the fact is that if you have two points, there's a unique line to them. And then the other fun fact that was also known to Euclid is that if I take three non-collinear points, and I take three points, and I require that they don't lie on the line, then there's a unique circle that passes through that. Okay? So, and you know, again, you can write down the equations of these things. Um, so maybe let me just, tell you, so, you know, uh, Lisa already mentioned that I work on moduli spaces, so what are these things? So let me try to give you some idea of what happens, right? So, you know, if you have a line in the plane, then you can write this equation as ax plus by plus c equals zero, okay? So th that's how you write down the equation of the line, and then, you know, the line is determined by the coefficients a, b, and c. The one caveat here is that if I scale all of the numbers at the same time, then I get the same line. You know, the line x equals y and the line 2x equals 2y are the same line, okay? Because you can just cancel the two and it's not there anymore, yeah? But, you know, the way you can think about this is, and, you know, this is like a very important point and it's an extra level of abstraction, right? The objects themselves, the lines themselves, are somehow parameterized by a space itself. So sort of there is a master space somehow whose points are parameterizing the lines. And that's the kind of thing that we call the moduli space. In this case, what's that space? That space is the tuples A, B, C of the scaling, which are the coefficients that define this line. And that's you know, a good example of a moduli space is uh, as good as I think I'm going to get today. Um, and but the point to make is that the geometric objects themselves, i.e. in this case the lines, form a space. And we can study the objects, whatever we want to figure out about lines, by studying the space of lines, okay? All right, so now remember what we want to do is that we want to figure out lines that pass through two points. Now you see, if I ask that the line pass through a point, I can just plug it in. So for instance, let me say that I I ask that the line pass to the point one, zero, so I plug in one for x and zero for y, so now it becomes a plus c equals zero, so I get the relation. Similarly, if I ask that I pass to zero, one, then I could plug x to be zero and y to be one, and then I plug it in and I get b plus c is equal to zero. And then, you know, since these were up to scaling, I can choose c to be whatever, 
number I want other than zero, so let me choose a minus one so that my equation looks nice, and then it looks like x plus y equals one, and I drew the line for it, okay? So you know, what this is supposed to sort of, the thing that you're supposed to get out of this is that geometric objects themselves, you know, come in families, and then you can study the objects by studying this family, okay? All right. So that's the story for lines. The story for circle is pretty similar, so I'm not going to say much about that. But now the next question that you can ask, okay, so what happens if you make the degree higher? So a line has degree one, but what if I wanted to solve higher degree equations? So you know, in particular, if you want to study you know, equations of motions, like you know, the orbit of the Earth is given by an ellipse, or like you know, the, if you throw a projectile, then you get the parabola and so on and so forth, these are conic sections, so you might be interested in finding you know, the equations of conic sections in the plane, and you know, we can write down all the possible equations of conic sections, this time there is an x squared, an xy, a y squared, an xy and a constant, right? So altogether there are six possible equations, again this is only determined up to scaling, so then it makes sense to ask how many conic sections pass through five points in the plane. And then there is nothing, you know, one thing that mathematicians like is that to generalize. You know, once you've set this thing up, there's nothing stopping you from generalizing. So I could ask the same question about degree D curves in the plane, right? So that I can ask how many degree D curves pass through D times D plus three over two points. And now you can say, why is it like that? So because you can again count the coefficients, right? So you know, you make a little uh, triangle for yourself. You know, there's one constant, there are two linear terms, x and y. There are three quadratic terms, x squared, x, y, y squared. Four cubic terms, five quartic terms, five degree, four terms, and so on and so forth. You see that each time you add a degree, you add d plus one new terms. And then you can count that, and then you know there are d plus one times d plus two over two coefficients. Again, the details here don't matter as much as that. You know there is an equation. You can count how many degrees of freedom this equation belongs to, and then there is a space of degree d plane curves given by the coefficients of this equation up to scaling. Okay. <clears throat> All right, so for instance, like, you know, again, you can ask this question that, you know, let me ask for curves that pass through a point. Say that this, you say one, zero, so what you do is you go back to your equation and you plug in x to be one, y to be zero. So if you do that, only the terms that don't have any y terms survive, right? And so you get a relation like this, that those coefficients have to add up to zero for the curve of degree d to pass to that point one, zero. Okay? And now, of course, you put all your points and you get a set of linear equations, so then finding the curve becomes an exercise in solving a system of linear equations, which is another thing that Mike has been learning. So, you know, um, you know here is a problem that he encountered early on in the semester. You know, this is one of these word problems that we'll come back to, right? So, you know, you have two siblings. The sum of their ages is 10, the difference of their ages is 2. So what, is the, what are the ages of the siblings? And for the life of me, I don't, and like, I don't know how this problem makes sense, right? Because there's no way you would know the sum of the ages of two siblings if you didn't know, um, if you didn't know each of the individual ages. The difference you would know, right? Like you know that Riva was born when Micah was 8, so their difference is always 8, but the sum, but anyway, these word problems you never ask to make too much sense, right? But anyway, so then there is a process of solving these kinds of linear equations that we teach in Math 310 and Math 320. So if you don't know this, you must definitely take these courses. Um, and you know, what you do is you eliminate one of the variables, right? You look at your equation, you have x plus y and x minus y. You say, aha, uh -huh, if I add these two equations, there's a plus y and a minus y, they go away. And then I get the two x is 12 or x is six, and then you can plug it back in and find that uh, what, what the y value is. And you learn that you know, if you have siblings that are ages six and four, then the sum of their ages is 10 and their difference is two. 
Okay, so this algorithm is often called the Gaussian or Gauss-Jordan elimination. And as I learned fairly recently, uh, you know, it was known way before Gauss and uh, Jordan. And we'll, I'll tell you a little bit about the story in a minute. But the way that you should think about it is that this tells us how many curves at degree d there are passing through d times d plus 3 over 2 general points. And there is a unique such curve, much like there was a unique line passing through two points or a unique conic passing through five points, there is a unique curve of degree d passing through d times d plus 3 over 2 general points. And now you should say, what does this general mean? What it means is that you need to choose your points somewhat randomly. There is a more precise meaning to it, like, you know, the points for which there isn't a unique curve, the coordinates of such points satisfy some polynomial equations. Okay? And you should be confused about this if you haven't seen this before, because, like, certainly mathematicians were confused for about 200 years. So, you know, I read this, um, lovely article by uh, Jeremy Gray, and I learned uh, a little bit about the story about this, and maybe I'll tell you a little bit about it. So you see, um, certainly, like, people knew how to solve system of linear equations, uh, you know, about, like, 150 before the common era. Certainly, Chinese mathematicians knew how to solve system of linear equations. And apparently, the way they would do this is, you know, they would write, I mean, I want to say textbooks, but I mean, uh, it wasn't quite textbooks at the time, but let's, uh, you know, they had like these ancient textbooks where they would have these problems like the sibling problem that I gave you, and then they would work this out. So, you know, it's, it's interesting, you know, mathematicians have been torturing the rest of the population with word problems, you know, for a long time. Apparently already in uh, 1800 before the common era, Right, there were tablets of these word problems found in uh, Mesopotamia. So, like, you know, this was uh, nothing new that. Um, <clears throat> but anyway, so they knew, like, how to solve the system of linear equations, but, you know, they didn't have sort of, like, they knew the algorithm, but sort of they didn't formulate it as an algorithm the way we would do it now. It was just like, you, you know, this calculus textbook style where they would give you an example and they would work it out and then the student was supposed to learn, I think, from there how to do it, if I understand this correctly. Then, I, then Newton, uh, in around 1670, apparently developed the uh, elimination method that we know. Um, but people didn't really understand, like, linear relations. So, you know, so what they ran into various, um, they, they ran into various contradictions and precisely in this problem that we are talking about, right? So like they were interested in how many cubics are there through nine points in the plane and they thought that there was always one. But simultaneously they sort of knew a Bezu theorem which said that, you know, if you have two cubics then they intersect in nine points. So then they had this paradox that, you know, if I have the intersection of two cubics, then they intersect in nine points. On the other hand, if I ask that uh, how many cubics pass to those nine points, there is only one. <clears throat> so, you know, it took apparently a while to work this out, and Maclaurin was, uh, apparently in 1720, Maclaurin pointed out this uh, contradiction, and he wrote a letter, letter to Kramer uh, sort of asking him about it. So, you know, for, uh, you know, the younger members of the audience, sort of a letter is what an email was uh, back in the days, yeah. So, uh, um, and, uh, you know, then as would happen, as in 1744, Kramer wrote a letter to Euler saying that, hey, there is this paradox, uh, have you thought about it? Um, and this became known as Kramer's paradox. Um, and, you know, Euler really worked on this. And in 1750, he wrote, um, paper where he proved the following statement that I always assign the graduate students taking algebraic geometry, yeah. Um, you know, when do five points, when, when is there more than one conic through five points? Right, we said that through five general points there is a unique conic. And then he discovered that, you know, five points lie on a unique conic precisely when no four of them are collinear. 
you know, the grad students in the audience will be familiar with this uh, homework problem. Um, but you know, and then he said the cubics are way too complicated. Sort of he understood that certain relations, um, you know, were implied by other relations, but you know, there were too many variables and too many equations, so he wasn't, um, um, and then, you know, uh, vector spaces the way we know them weren't defined until Piano in 1888. So the full understanding of what was going on took, you know, a good 200 years. So if you're not completely following everything about this, so you know that you are in good company here. All right, but going back, you know, we can completely tell actually what happens, um, you know, when do points fail, when, when is there more than one curve to d times d plus three points, you know, you, over two points, what you do is you write down the matrix, the linear relations that you get from that, you get the d times d plus three over two times d plus one times d plus two over two matrix, and the requirement is that the, the maximal minors of those things uh, should not all vanish. If, as long as one maximal minor is non-zero, there will be a unique unique solution, and otherwise there will be infinitely many solutions. All right, okay, but you see, so these were interpolation problems, right, um, where we were, you know, there was only one solution, we can in principle find the solution, and, but you know, in more general cases, like if I leave the plane and I have space and I want to pass a curve through a bunch of points, typically, the problem will not yield linear equations. There will be very complicated equations. There will not be a unique solution, and very, most often it will not be possible to find a solution. So instead, the kind of question you can ask, does there exist a solution, and how many solutions are there, okay? Um, so there is one beautiful theorem that uh, hopefully <coughs> everybody should know, and this is the fundamental theorem of algebra, and it says the following thing. A polynomial of degree d in one variable has exactly d complex roots counted with multiplicity. And, uh, you know, in other words, what that means is that you can factor that polynomial into linear factors over the complex numbers. And it may happen that some of these roots repeat. Like, it could be, like, you know, for instance, you can look at x to the n, right? That's x times x times x times n times. And the only root of that is zero, but it occurs n times. And that's called the multiplicity of the root. You know, when you factor it into these linear factors, some of these linear factors can be the same, and the multiplicity of that linear factor is the number of times it appears, okay? All right, so this is a beautiful theorem, and in particular, it counts the number of solutions of a polynomial of degree d in uh, one variable. But the point that I want you to get out of this is that the number of solutions does not depend on the coefficients. Right? It only depends on the degree. So no matter what polynomial I give you, as long as its degree is d, then I, the coefficient can be anything you want, then there are d solutions. Okay? What that means is that you know, if you want to count the number of solutions, sometimes you are free to vary these coefficients. Yeah? <clears throat> and the idea that I want to get across is that a lot of times, in order to solve a really complicated polynomial system, you do not solve the polynomial system that you were given, but you solve a different polynomial system that's simpler to solve. And if you do it carefully, right, then the number of solutions does not change. And what does it mean to do it carefully in here, right? The requirement is that the degree of the polynomial is d, so I'm not allowed to make a d be zero. But as long as I don't make a d zero, then I can count the number of solutions by taking any polynomial of degree d. All right. So now we want to apply this to, uh, to solve another problem, so it's time for a magic trick. All right, let's get our magic tools, and I think what I'll do, let's see what happens. Before we forget. No, no, I'll jump, but uh, let's just. All right, I think I'll randomly choose some people to help me. Maybe I'll have Lisa and Julius help me. <coughs> yeah. All right, so you get blue ruler and a pink ruler. Lisa gets two green rulers. All right, so what you're supposed to do is give me two random lines. They, that's not random. What do you mean? Oh, I see in 3D. It's in 3D, in three dimensions. Give me, 
All right, so you see, they've given me four random lines, and the question that I want to ask is how many lines, so I have the solution line, intersect all four of these lines? Well, Victor knows the answer, so you're not allowed to say it, okay? <laughs> and what we are going to do is we're going to do magic to find the answer here, okay? Now you see, the point is, that why am I asking four lines? If you think about the space of lines in space, it depends on four parameters. So the way you should think about it is that I have a point. It varies in three space. I have another point. That one also varies in three space. So there looks like there's six degrees of freedom. But you see, if you draw the line between them, if you vary the point along the line, then the line doesn't change. So you ha you're overcounting by two. So there are four freedoms, and we put four constraints on it. You see, the point is that I don't know what the solution is. I mean, I can try to fit it, but it's very hard to see. So what Lisa is going to do is she's going to do some magic for us. What she'll do is she'll take her left hand and swing it around and make it intersect or meet the ruler on her right hand. And she'll do that with a great flourish. <laughs> OK? Now you see, what we do is we trace the solution to the system, and I claim that at this point, we can see what the solutions are. So Lisa somehow managed to magic, uh, magically produce the solutions for us. So now let's think about this. If my solution line is meeting Lisa's lines, right, they can do one of two things. They can pass to the point of intersection. Or if they don't pass to the point of intersection, then they must meet these lines somehow like this, in which case they lie in the plane spanned by, by um, Lisa's rulers. Okay? So let's see how many solutions there are. So maybe we'll move uh, Julius closer so that uh, you see. <clears throat> right? So what happens is that. Uh, <laughs> Well, this, yeah, you know. So here is the plane, right? And Julius's lines meet this plane in these two points. And now you see, we know that in the plane, to two points, there is a unique line. So I can see what that solution is, and that's my solution. All right, and the other possibility is that they could have passed to the point of intersection, right? But you see, in that case, if I pass to the point of intersection, then I need to lie in the plane spanned by this point and this line, in which case this line intersects that plane in one point, and then that's my solution. So you see somehow Lisa uh, managed to magic the solutions out of thin air so that we can see what these solutions are. So let's give them all a hand. <laughs> <laughs> And you see, all right, let me turn this off before we get. Uh, uh, and you see, what happens here is that, of course, like you see, there is an art here, and then there is a science here, right? The art was knowing what to do. And then, you know, Lisa very, very helpfully knew that she had to intersect the two lines, right? Whereas there's also a science saying that each of these solutions appear with multiplicity one. But you know, once you do that, what well, you conclude is that there are two lines that intersect four general lines in space. Okay? And this is the kind of thing that I'm talking about when I'm talking about specialization. And the key is that you take, a, you know, the way you can think about this is that you know, there were all these equations, and when Lisa was moving her arm, she changed the, the, the coefficients of these equations until it became a system that was easy to understand. Okay? And now, uh, you know, you can do this kind of thing, uh, you know, ad infinitum, like, you know, you know, for instance, there are five lines in four space that meet six general planes, 14 lines in five space that meet eight general three spaces. You know, I can go on forever with this. This is one of the things I love doing. It's a game, and I compute these numbers, right? In fact, you know, you can use precisely this idea that you can intersect these lines, and from these, like, find the solutions, to give a general rule for computing all, science, all sorts of things like this, that, um, you know, the, um, all sorts of linear spaces satisfying constraints. And such rules are called geometric little Richardson rules. Ravi Bakil gave one in 2006. I gave a different one in 2009, right? And you know, you might be wondering why on earth do we care about these problems? Um, you know, we care about, I care about these problems because they are fun. I can just sit in my office and play these games and count these things, right? But that's not what we tell NSF or the college, right? Uh, 
what we tell them, you know, they, they compute the representations of the GLN, the symmetric group, the structure constants, the Grassmannian particle physics and quantum mechanics. It's not as fun as the magic show, let me tell you. All right, but anyway, these numbers are truly important and you want to know them. All right, so in the last few minutes, what I want to do is I want to tell you what, um, what I've been thinking in the last two, three years and uh, you know, the kinds of problems that I've been thinking about. So you know, we've done interpolation in the plane, we've done interpolation of linear spaces, but you have about like interpolation of higher degree curves in larger dimensional spaces. So these are the kinds of things that I've been thinking about. And then you know, if you have a curve in space, again, we are thinking about these in, over the complex numbers, so the, you know, the topological picture looks something like this. It's a surface with some number of holes. In this case, it's a pretzel with three holes, right? And um, you know, such a thing is called the genus of the surface. So this is a genus three surface, or genus three curve, right? And a curve has two invariants, the degree and the genus. And the kind of question that you can ask, when can I pass a curve of degree d and genus g to a given set of points, okay? And here, my two of my collaborators, Eric Larson and Isabel Vogt, have a beautiful theorem. You know, it's a lovely theorem. So you, you have some inequalities that, that make sure that you have curves of degree, G, degree D and genus G in R space, but you know. And then it says that you know, there is an inequality that is satisfied, right, such that you, know, you have a curve of degree D and genus G through N points in R space if and only if this inequality is satisfied. So it's a complete answer to this thing, except that there are four exceptions. Okay, and in some sense here, the exceptions are the most beautiful thing. So maybe I'll tell you what one of the exceptions are. So I think I have my curve here, right? So here is my curve that I want to pass through a bunch of points, right? In the first exception, let's say five, two, three, what happens is that this curve lies on a very special surface. It lies on a hyperboloid. Or if you want to know what a hyperboloid is, that if you've ever made pasta, you know you can leave the spaghetti, you leave it and then the shape that you get is a hyperboloid, right? So like, <clears throat> you know, the point is that you can only pass a hyperboloid through so many points. So you can't pass the curve through more points than you can pass the hyperboloid, okay? And so those, these are all the exceptions that are essentially defined, described for a similar reason. Yeah, maybe the thing that I should say, how on earth do you go about proving something like this? So you see, the way you want to think about this is that you have your curve, and then you have, you have your points in this thing. I want to see whether I can pass this curve to a bunch of points. Instead, what I say is that let me take the points in this curve and move the points in random directions. And then the question that you ask, can I follow this curve as I move the points, right? So the way that's described is that if you have your curve, you have your tangent direction. So then there's my you have your tangent direction, and you have all these normal directions that point out outside, yeah? So now if you want to follow, move your curve, what you do is you give a normal direction in each of the points, and then what you do is you push your curve along the normal direction, and that gives you the deformations of this curve. And basically the question becomes, as I move the points in random directions, can I follow the curve with them, right? And such things depend, uh, fundamentally on the property of what's called a normal bundle and whether this is stable, meaning that like, you know, are there special directions? Like for instance, if we had this curve in the hyperboloid, then there is the direction in the hyperboloid, that's pretty special. What we want to say is that there are no special directions in this, um, vec in this normal bundle and that's, that's expressed by a property of stability. And the last few years I've been thinking about when are normal bundles of curves stable? And then the game is similar. You know, we are going to understand this normal bundle on the curve by making it simpler. And how do you make it simpler? If you have a curve, you break it into pieces and then try to reconstruct it from the pieces. Anyways, just to conclude, there are the, here is sort of the types of theorems that we've been proving in the last um, <coughs> few years with my collaborators, Eric Larson and Isabel Vogt, and 
various uh, other collaborators like um, Jeff Smith, who was a postdoc here, and Eric Giovinelli, who is back there. Um, and you know, basically what it says is that the normal bundle of curves are most of the time stable except for a few exceptions. And we know a complete classification of the exceptions in three space and four space, and otherwise we know that there are only finitely many exceptions in any given R space. And so this is the kind of things that I've been thinking about in recent years, and let me stop there. There are some references if you're interested. Thank you for your attention. <clears throat> for the online folks so they can hear you. Uh, thank you, Zad. Uh, just a quick question. What does BN curve stand for? How is it different from any curve that passes through the points? Well, you need to make sense of what curves you're talking about. BN curve stands for brill noether curve. And what it does is that, you know, in the brill noether range, which was the first inequality that I gave you, there is a unique component of the Hilbert scheme, parameterizing you know, a non-degenerate curve with degree D and G and SG, which in addition dominates the moduli space of curves. So that component is called the brill noether component, and any curve in that component is the, is the BN curve, okay? <clears throat> Why does the specialization technique uh, when you specialize the lines, preserve the number of solutions? Oh. Well, um, yeah, there's something to check. Basically what you do is the following. So you have the cycles that um, correspond to these, like, you know, you have the cycle of lines in the Grassmannian that intersect this line, right? And then the point is that when you specialize, they continue to intersect generically transversely. That's something you need to check. Okay? I mean, we understand the tangent spaces of these things, so you can really check those kind of 